go deeper in your faith, it's all about the details. That's what we're talking about today at OneChurch.tv. What's up and welcome to OneChurch.tv. My name is Carlo and I'm so glad that you are connecting with us today. Right now, if this is your first time or first time in a long time connecting with us, go ahead and take out your phone and text CONNECT1C to 97000. This will allow us to get to know you, allow you to get to know us, just so you can stay up to date with everything that's going on in the life of our church. Again, we are so glad that you're with us today. In the next few seconds, we're going to start with some worship through singing and song. We're going to have a time later on in the service to be generous through giving, and of course, we're going to be challenged by an encouraging message. We are so glad that you were here. Welcome to One Church. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal joy I am. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance.
walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet i know the night won't last your word will come to sing your praise again Jesus you're still enough keep me within your love my heart will sing your praise again promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness i'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed your promise still stands great is your faithfulness Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. Oh, you've never failed.
never fail You've never failed me yet I never will forget You've never failed me yet I never will forget Hey One Church Carlo again. It's that time of the service where we're going to be generous through giving. When you give through OneChurch.tv, you not only allow us to continue our mission of leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, it allows us to make a real difference in this community through food that gets to be distributed through Mana Cafe, through lives that are changed, through this very medium right here, us being able to broadcast to the world the great message of hope. So thank you so much for being generous. Go ahead and pull out your phone. You can go ahead and give through the One Church app. You can send in a check to the address you'll see on the screen. No matter what you do, we just want to thank you so much for being generous. I'm going to pray for our offering, and then we're going to continue on with our service. God, we thank you so much for allowing us to partner with you in giving. Would you bless every single person right now connected to this service? You know what they're going through, what they're fighting, and God, we know that you were big and able to meet their needs. Help us to be generous, God, because we know you take our little and you do so much in the lives of others. Thank you for the great opportunity we have to give in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for giving. Guys, we are full into summer, which means normally everybody's hanging out the, at the pool. I don't know what you guys are doing. Uh, the pools, some of you pools may be closed. Others, you may actually have some pools in your backyard. Others of you, you may have went out and bought some of those kiddie pools and got in just because you are wanting to have a little bit of break from the heat. I shared with you guys last week that one of my most vivid memories is swimming at Barksdale Pool and going off a high dive for the very first time. And I was scared to death. And I, I just, it was just scary. And uh, I, I'd grown up around the water, and, uh, and I love the water, but there's just something about the height of that high dive. And I, I, this is not my notes, but one of the things, my parents bribed me to go on the high dive, right? They promised me they would give me a Star Wars figure. This is around 1977, and A New Hope had just came out. And I got this little uh, Death Star Trooper Star Wars figure that they bribed me to jump to my death. Uh, uh, but I love it. I still have the figure, believe it or not. But I just, we love water. My family loves water. I hope you guys, uh, you, you probably are been in the water or wanting to get in the water. Uh, I love, uh, uh, love the ocean. Uh, I actually, when I was in high school, I was a lifeguard and I really enjoyed that. And once I had kids, my kids hung out a lot by the pool. We've never owned a pool, but we've always tried to be friends with people who had pools. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And we started them in the kiddie pool, and uh, you remember the kiddie pool, don't you? I mean, the water depth of about 24 inches. Uh, my kids loved it. Me, not so much. Uh, in fact, I always hesitated, hesitated to get into that Petri dish filled with urine and floating baby roosts. I know kids have to start somewhere, thus the kiddie pool, right? But I wanted to get them out and beyond the 24 inches of water into the six foot as soon as possible. Why? Because I believe that life is so much more fun in the deep end. 
You can play a lot more. The water is fresher. More people can hang out with you in the deep end. And that's kind of what we're talking about in this new series we're calling Out of the Shallows. We're exploring this idea of the shallow end and the deep end. Now, behind me, you see there's some shallow uh, part. Well, I mean, some of you, you may be going to the beach this summer, maybe not, but this is the shallow part. And I, I never really liked playing in the shallows, even when I am at the beach, because sand just kind of gets everywhere. I like playing in the deep end of the pool. I love going to the ocean. Again, I've swam in the Pacific. I've swam in the Atlantic, in the Mediterranean. I've snorkeled at, at Lahaina Harbor in Maui. I swam on the North Shore of Oahu. I love the ocean. Now, here's the thing about the ocean, though. You can either stay on the beach or in the surf where it's really shallow, or you could wander out into the vast deep blue sea and experience so much color and life that it's hard to describe. In fact, look as the background is changes, look how much deeper and how much more interesting we have. You have all of the fish. Uh, you have all of the sharks. I'll never forget when I was in Oahu, I was swimming out in the, pretty deep, and I remember sharks being above me, and that didn't freak me out. Uh, sharks are kind of like bees. If you don't bother them, they won't bother you. Uh, but uh, where I just kind of lost my mess is I was kind of down by the coral, and this big, huge uh, eel, this, um, this huge eel just pops up and goes, oh, and that's when I was out. I was out like... Uh, it was not good. So, But there's a big difference between snorkeling and just staying on top of the surface and scuba diving, isn't it? Playing on the sand and playing in the depths. You are in the same ocean, but it's so much more beautiful and interesting below the depths. Well, God's Word is like the ocean. It is shallow enough that we can all play in the surf and have a lot of fun. But it is also deep enough to see some amazing wonders, vibrant fish, coral reefs that go on for miles. So my challenge for you and all of us is to go deeper in this series, to wade into the surf and go deeper in our faith. And that the only way for us to do that is to start reading the Bible for yourself, to invite you to start feeding yourself. We looked at this big idea last week, but it's really our series big idea, and it's simply this. The shallows can be bottle-fed, but the depths have to be self-fed. And I encourage us to go deeper and to get out of the shallows. That means you're going to have to start feeding yourselves and learning to read the Bible for yourself. And last week, we showed you an approach of how you can go deep in the Bible to feed yourself, and it's all about the acrostic soap. Soap. S stands for scripture. You're going to have to read the scripture for yourself. You're going to have to crack that book or open up your phone and download the Bible app and, uh, and you just dig into it for yourself. Today, we're going to be looking at the O in soap and that is observation. Observation. You're going to look for something that you think God wanted to put right in front of you or that's important to you or that's relevant to you. And maybe write it down in your own words. That's what we're going to be talking about today. The A in SOAP stands for application. And next week, Kim is going to talk about applying the scripture. And we're going to see that spiritual depth is not measured by IQ, but by I do. That's really important. And then we're going to get to the P, to pray about everything you just looked at. And in week four and five, Pastor Carlo is going to continue to take us deep. So this is the process that we have to help you understand the Bible for yourself. Now, the secret for going out deep spiritually is not listening to somebody else teach the Bible, but digging into it for yourself, right? Don't you wonder sometimes how a person can pull an insight from the Bible that you've looked at many, many times, but you weren't able to see what was being presented? I mean, somebody's teaching and you're like, I've never seen that. That. But I mean, that sometimes that can be frustrating and discouraging. Other times, it just makes you a little bit curious. And my hope is that in this brief series, we're going to help you work your way and work it out the process of doing that on your own. So, the first step to getting to know the scripture that's the S in soap is through observation. Today, we're going to be looking at the O, which stands for observation. And here's our big idea today going deep is all in the details. It's all about observation. Let me say that one more time. Our big idea 
today is going deep is all in the details. It's all about observation. Now, through observation, we discover what the Bible says, and that is the process I go through every time I prepare my sermons. In fact, I did this with this sermon right here. I started right here where we are today in observation. And my goal is to kind of share with you how I study the Bible. And, and we're going to be looking at a couple of different passages of Scripture, both found in the middle of your Bible. We're going to be in Psalms, and then we're going to end in the book of Proverbs. Now, many people want to know the meaning of the Bible so much that they rapidly pass through and go beyond observation and just jump to the application. And that is the formula for error. You can't apply what you don't know. You can't apply what you haven't observed. So, observation focuses on answering the question, what do I see? Let's say that one more time. Observation focuses on answering the question, what do I see? All right, do this. If I put your hands up, what do I see, right? Here's the definition to observe. It is to inspect or to take note of something to watch carefully with attention to details. Detective Sherlock Holmes from Scotland Yard, he was quick to point out to Watson, Watson, you see, but you do not observe. And most of us, we think that we're actually better observing than we really are. So I'm going to give you a quick test, and I want you to grade your own paper, and let's check your observation skills. A few questions, and I want you to blurt them out, and then let's see if you got them right, all right? Now, you spent the past week with a good friend, maybe as recently as last evening, or if you're married, you certainly spent that evening with your spouse, right? Here's the question. What exactly was he or she wearing when you spent time with them most recently? Can you answer that? Here's another. Which inscription does not appear on the back of a dollar bill? Notice I didn't say 50 because all the one church people said, I ain't seen that forever, right? But a dollar bill, right? So uh, it is this. In God we trust, the great seal, or e pluribus unum. We've all handled dollar bills in our life, right? Surely all of us would know that. Or here, here's a third. How many times... Are you, uh, how many miles, excuse me, are on your car's odometer today? You know that? What about this one? Is your gas gauge full or half full, or if you're a pessimist, half empty, right? Here's another question Was your mother right handed or left handed? Another question. Uh, what, uh, what's the brand name of your stove that you use to cook on every day? Now, some of you are like, cook? <laughs> what's that? Okay, that's a different sermon for another time. All right, feed yourself, right? How about this one? How many steps lead to the second floor in your home? I mean, or maybe the, how many steps lead to your basement? You walk it every day, but have you really observed it? Or maybe where you go to work. Um, every time I go to work, I have to climb a flight of steps. How many steps are on those? Have you ever counted them? You see, how many did you get right? I would say for many of us, we probably, yeah, we've done it a thousand times. We've went through the rote of it, but we truly have not observed. And that's what I'm hoping to change today. Let's look at a verse found in the longest chapter of the Bible, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 has 176 verses. Isn't that interesting? Now, here's what's so cool about Psalm 119. Psalm 119 follows the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, that's the Hebrew alphabet. If, it, we were, if we were to put it in ours, it would be A, B, C, D, E, right? And the entire chapter of Psalm 119 is all about God's Word. So many times, Hebrew boys, Hebrew girls, as they're learning uh, the Hebrew alphabet, they would memorize Psalm 119, and they would be able to memorize the Hebrew alphabet as well as all about the characteristics of God's Word. And let's see what the psalmist says about observation and observing the Bible. This is Psalm 119, verse 18, and this is what the psalmist says. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. Now, let's just do some observations on this. 
All right. How many, how many words are in this verse? Go ahead and count them. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. And as we go just beyond word count, the first thing I would observe if I were to make a list on a piece of paper is that this is a prayer. He's not writing this to his brother or to a friend. He's writing to the only one who can really open his eyes to see. He's offering a prayer to God. You know, Psalm 119 is full of prayers, except for the first three verses in verse 115. Every other of the 176 verses is a prayer. It speaks to God as he's writing the song. Now, here's the thing I would encourage you guys to do. Some of you guys, your prayer life is kind of eh, kind of stagnant. I would just take a verse and pray it to God. Quote God back to God. But let's look at another observation of Psalm 119, verse 18. This prayer, the prayer is a focused on just one request, only one request. And the request, request is in the opening words, open my eyes. He's really asking the Lord, help me see what is here in your word. This prayer is very specific. He's not interested in a casual glance. He's asking, open my eyes to see truth. And this prayer is also an acknowledgement. Look at this verse again. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. He's acknowledging the truths are what? Wonderful. As I read it, I want to know fully and completely, as best as I can, what it is saying. And then there's the word instructions. Well, what are instructions? If you're a man, you have no idea, all right? I grew up, my dad, uh, everything for Christmas, he would do these instructions. Uh, he would get the toy, and he would throw away the instructions. And it's so frustrating. And my, my bicycle had one wheel. We'll call it a unicycle or a bicycle put together by Bobby Edmondson, right? I mean, but you, we all know the power of well-written instructions. Instructions are detailed information telling how something should be done. Here's a pic of a Lego Millennium Falcon. Anyone ever put together a Lego set before? Well, the Millennium Falcon is the biggest and the most detailed Lego set ever made, with over 7,500 pieces, and get this, a 495-page instruction booklet. Now, I love Star Wars, but shoot me, right? And now, imagine having to put these 7,500 Lego pieces together without an instruction booklet. All right, there's a Greek word for that, and it's called impossible, right? I mean, you see, instructions help us do things better, do things faster, do things more efficient, and to do it right. And that is what God's Word does for all of us if we follow the instructions. Jesus wants to make you better and to make you better at life. And the only way that's going to happen is if we read the Bible, observe it, and we're going to talk about next week, apply it. Because there's no benefit if you know God's word, but you actually don't do it. But again, that's next week, all right? Let's go back to the verse. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. So step one, observe. There is no earlier step than this one, but it's going to take some work. And that leads us to the second scripture we're going to be looking at today, Proverbs chapter 2. Observing, digging into the Bible yourself, and feeding yourself is going to take some work and some action on your part. Now, you know when I am hungry, one of the things that just doesn't make any sense, and maybe you're that way, is when I'm hungry, I go to the kitchen, I open up the refrigerator door, and you know what I do? I stand there and look. Any of y'all ever do that? I mean, the fridge starts beeping at me to close the door, close the door. But I'm looking for something to eat, something that's already fixed. Do any of you guys do that? You stand there with the door wide open, waiting for a complete and hot meal to pop out for us, right? Well, that's never going to happen. It's going to take some work to cook your food yourself. But unfortunately, we're a fast food generation. We want others to cook it, prepare it, and give it to us. But there's something to be said when you take the word and feed yourself. It takes work, and that's what we're going to discover in Proverbs chapter 2. The wisest person who ever lived, King Solomon, writes this in verse 1. My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. 
Solomon is writing to his child. And he says, listen and treasure. We need to listen and read God's word. We have to observe what God's word is saying. That's action. But then he writes, treasure my commands. And that's an attitude. Quick question. Have any of you ever fallen in love? I hope so. I fell in love with the woman who became my wife, Kim. For two years, I chased that woman until she finally caught me. <laughs> I mean, I did all kinds of uh, weird stuff. In fact, I'll tell you some of it. I stalked her, all right? Now, some of you are like, all right, stranger danger. I get it. I mean, I, I just so wanted to see her car that I remember parking at the Jiffy Burger on Madison Street. And it, it, her parents lived in Murfreesboro, and she was gone for the weekend. But I knew on Sunday night she was going to be coming back, and she would have to go Madison Street. So I waited there for two hours, just waiting and waiting, just to catch a glimpse of my lover, right? But she came the back way. <laughs> I mean, we all do weird things for love, right? Well, here's the thing about love and the attitude of love. Kim loves writing letters. She would write me little notes or or cards of encouragement. Now, when I got one of those letters, did I mumble, oh, great, another note from Kim. (sighs) Well, you better believe I read that. I sat down. And I cleared off my desk, and I'm like, okay, let's just clear my mind. I want to have, I want to be fresh for this letter. And I sat down, and I many times would have her a photograph for her, and I would read the first paragraph, and I would look at her photograph, and then I would reread that first paragraph, and 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 then I would go, okay, that's enough for today. I'll get back to the letter, and I wouldn't finish it. No, I wouldn't do that, right? I mean, I would read every single word, every letter four or five times. I read them outside my college classroom. I read them at night before I went to bed. I would tuck them underneath my pillow so if I woke up in the middle of the night, I could pull them out, read them all over again. Why? Because I was in love with the person who wrote them, and that's the way we have to get when it comes to the Word of God. Read it as though it was his love letter to you. And that is an attitude. we got to treasure God's word. But Solomon continues, Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Now we're going to break this up. We're going to observe just the verbs in this verse. Tune, concentrate, cry out, and ask. Those are the verbs found in this verse. All of those are action verbs calling us to do something. So let's look at the first verb, tune. Tune your ears to wisdom. Guys, what I have in my hand is a tuning fork. Now this is really interesting because you strike it and and it resonates a pitch when you put it towards the wood. I'm going to do it here in just a sec, but this is an A440 tuning fork. Now, what does that mean? Well, on a keyboard, there is a note, there's the A note, and when you strike that note, it reverberates 440 times per second. So, that is what you tune the entire instrument based upon the A440. It's kind of the plumb line, if you will. So, anytime you hear an orchestra play, many times they tune on A. They tune on the A440, and then they base every other note, whether it's in tune or out of tune, based upon this. So I'm getting ready to strike this so that you guys can hear it, the A440 tuning fork. So to enjoy music, the musical notes have to be in tune with one another. And when they're not, it will drive you crazy. Watch this video. So guys, we're talking about tuning our lives to God's standard. And here's an interesting thing. I got my son Jed here, and we're both trumpet players. And we can play the same note, same vowels and everything, and if one of us is out of tune, it's not going to sound good. In fact, you're going to start hearing these waves. Wah, 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 wah. So let's me and you, let's just play a C, and and then we're going to get it out of tune, and we'll put it back in. Okay? Ready? Okay, we're pretty much in tune. 
I'm going to do this again and I'm going to get out of tune. All right, let's do this. You hear those waves? It sounds really nasty. So I'm going to put myself back in tune and let's do this. Ready? started it was a little out of tune you kind of hear those waves that's what we're talking about if you're out of sync with God's standard if you're not in tune to his perfect way then there's going to be some dissonance there's going to be some disconnect and there's going to be some not so good music so when you tune a note you have to listen intensely and match the pitch just like me and Jed in playing the trumpet, I can be playing the same note with the same fingering, but it can be out of tune. And when the notes aren't in tune, you hear that sound like waves crashing against each other, and there's this dissonance. One must intently tune their ears and listen to match the notes. Well, it's the same thing with tuning a piano. There are average 230 piano strings, and each string is stretched to between 50 and 100 pounds of pressure. The total pressure of all those strings together is about 18 to 20 tons. And when one wants to tune a piano, they have to match the, to the pitch of one note, the A note, the A440. So once you do that, you actually tune the rest of the notes based to that one A note. That is exactly what you and I are to do with God's Word. God's Word is like A440, and we are to match and tune every little bit, every area of our lives to that perfectly. So when we date, how we date is out of kilter with God's Word. We need to change and tune our dating life to exactly how God wants it to be. And when we're handling our finances, when it's askew and not in line with God's Word, His A440, we are to change to him. Tune our ears to wisdom. Let's look at that next verb. The next verb is to concentrate. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on what? Understanding. The Hebrew word for concentrate is the word nata. And it means to look intently at something. To look, focus intently on someone and as you move towards them. Solomon knew what we all know, that we will drift towards whatever has your attention. When something grabs or captures our attention, you're going to tune and turn that direction. I'll never forget, y'all have heard me tell this story before, living out this principles when I was in college. I was running in Clarksville down Madison Street, getting some exercise right in front of Kroger, when a car blew their horn, and I thought they were blowing at me. Because I'm like, hey, I'm, you know... I didn't have, I don't even think they had speed X or spandex or, and y'all know what I'm saying. Speed, I think I just combined speedos and spandex. That's unfortunate. Anyway, but I thought maybe they were, you know, honking at me. So I turned and I waved. And when I did that, I drifted over and I hit a telephone pole with my face, right? I mean, it was not fun, but wherever you're looking at, you will drift towards. Every one of us, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, you can all tell a story in your life about a time when our attention was fixed on something or someone that we knew wasn't good, and at the end of the day, we got hurt. We just got fixated. And we, it just turned out to we, we were concentrating on something worthless, and it turned out to damage us because attention influences direction and every direction has a destination and Solomon picks up on the same theme in Proverbs 4:25. He says this, let your eyes look straight ahead because whatever has your attention is going to determine the direction of your life, right? So, fix your gaze. That's what intentionality is, isn't it? Fix your gaze directly before you. Do not swerve to the right or to the left, keep your foot from evil. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, he is reminding us that whatever we're concentrating on, we're going to move towards. So concentrate on God's word. Wherever we gaze, we will go. As our gaze goes, we go. 
As our attention goes, we go. If something or someone grabs your attention, it grabs our lives and it grabs our future. Let's go back to the next verb found in verse 3. And it says to cry out. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. That word cry out refers to what a baby does when it's hungry, right? Listen to how Peter describes the desire for God's word. He compares that desire to a newborn longing for milk. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says this, Desire God's pure word as newborn babies desire milk. Now, think about this. How do babies desire milk? Incessantly, right? And then he says, then, look at this. It's basically, if you do this, then this will happen. Then you will grow in your salvation. You see, just as a baby grabs for the bottle, so you grab for the Bible. The baby has to have milk to sustain life physically. You and I have to have God's word to sustain our life spiritually. Get this. Kim and I, we have three boys, and when they were babies, we learned that about every three or four hours, a timer went off inside that little infant, and you better not ignore it. And you better get a bottle of milk there fast, pronto, right? As soon as you do, there was a great calm. That should be our attitude towards the Bible. Not just checking it off a checklist, but longing for it. A craving for the spiritual milk of God's word. Let's look at that last verb. And that last verb is to ask. Cry out for insight and ask for what? Understanding. The word ask is all about a continual action. In fact, I like how James 1.5 says this. He says, if any of us lacks wisdom, the only thing you need to do is ask, right? That's what, the, what we're talking about here. So this w- word ask is about a continual action. It's not that you just ask once. You ask and you ask and you ask and you ask and you ask. Imagine a toddler wanting some ice cream. And asking their mom, mom, can I have some ice cream? Mom, can I have some ice cream? Mom, can I have some ice cream? Mom, and you know, it's like, ah, right? Jesus says the same thing when he said it this way in Matthew chapter 7. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Are you needing some answers? Church, you need to continually read the Bible. Ask God for the answers. Be tenacious. Keep seeking. Keep asking. Keep knocking. Don't give up. Persevere. Keep on going. Just, God, I need this. I need this. I need to understand. I need your help. I need you to intervene. God, I need help. You go straight and you concentrate on God. You concentrate on his word and you keep on asking. You keep on seeking. You keep on knocking. And I promise you, when you do that, something will happen. Something will either happen with your circumstances or something will change inside of you. Now, Look at how much we've observed and dug into these three verses just by looking at the verbs. You see, observing takes work, and it takes some time, and that is what he says in the next verse. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like what? Hidden treasures. Note the diligence involved in the study of God's Word right? I mean, we are to search for it as one would search for hidden treasure. You dig into God's Word like you would dig into treasure. Most of us have never dug for treasure. Most of us, we've never searched for silver or gold. I have panned for silver and gold in New Mexico and California. And you know what? It's one of those things, it's the continuous action, but many times you've got to dig for it. You got to, most of us, we, it's biblical wisdom is like a precious ore. Let me tell you where you don't find silver or gold. You don't find it normally just sitting on top of the dirt, just staring you in the face. I mean, if you would, everybody would have silver or gold, right? So you have to pick up a pickaxe and you got to start digging overturning rocks, getting your hands dirty below the surface of the soil because silver and gold are found deep in the earth's crust and you have to work hard. You're going to have to sweat to uncover that treasure. It's not found just lying on the surface, but at a deeper level. 
The very truth of God is there, able to transform your life, but you've got to probe for it. You've got to penetrate the surface with more than just a cursory glance. You've got to grab some tools, and you've got to start digging. You have to treat it like treasure. I love Robert Ballard. I don't know if you've heard his name. Robert Ballard is a treasure hunter. He made a 14-year search for the sunken Titanic. For 14 years, he searched for that ship, the work, the effort, the cost, the time, and then that great day in 1985 when he found it lying on the bottom of the North Atlantic. Now Robert Ballard, what's captured his attention is looking for the remains of Amelia Earhart and her plane. So, in Fred Noonan and the person who was with him. You see, when we treat the scriptures like they are treasure, we will be tenacious. And what will happen? Verse 5. Then, you see there? That then is if you do this, then this will happen. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord and you will gain what? Knowledge of God. You will understand and gain the knowledge of God. Isn't that what we all want? to get out of the shallows, and if you are going to do that, you and I are going to have to dig in, and we're going to have to observe. So let's put all of these five verses in Proverbs chapter 2 together, and let's just list the verbs. First is listen, then treasure, tune in, concentrate, cry out, ask, search, seek, And when you do those things, what's going to happen to you? You're going to understand, and you're going to have gained knowledge. You and I just broke down and made some great observations about these five verses. And that is how we should approach every scripture, the S every time. We soap it, right? Scripture, observation, application, and then pray. Now, many times when we read the words and the um, the pages of the Bible, most of us really don't observe what those words say. I'll never remember the feeling uh, when I took the first course in my seminary days back in 1993 from a prof we called Dr. Howard Hendricks. We all called him prof, and he taught this this, uh, class called Bible Study Methods back when I was at Dallas Seminary. And when Howard Hendricks taught this course, we were all on the edge of our seats. I'd never met a teacher like that man. When he taught you how to study the Bible, it just came alive. We read Acts 1-8 in class. Just one verse. Actually, 35 words. In fact, I'm going to read it to you just quickly. And it says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, and throughout Judea, and in Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And Prof gave us an assignment. When you go home tonight, I want you to write down on a sheet of paper 50 observations from Acts 1-8. And my first thought was, you've got to be kidding me. 50? There's not even 50 words in this verse. I'm, I'm going to be doing good to pull 10 or 12 out. But I sat down in my little apartment And I wrote down 50 observations. And I'll never forget bringing it back to class that next day. And we all laid our 50 observations down in front of Prof. Hendricks. And he says, good work. Now go home tonight and find 50 more. And you know what? We did. 100 observations from that one verse. Here's a a, a picture of me and Prof. together. Prof. was such an amazing man, and he really did instill in me this love of observing and studying the Bible. And ladies and gentlemen, we have an infinite text among us and in front of us. It's unfathomable. The truths are bottomless, but you're going to have to get into it for yourself. We're going to have to do what Psalm 119 verse 18 says, open my eyes to see the wonderful truths of your instruction. You can take a verse of Scripture, you can take a section of the Bible, and keep yourself busy for the longest time just by digging into those words and seeing how they relate and interrelate to one another. Our big idea, going deep, is all about the details. It's all about observation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, I thank you so much, God, that you have given us Your word, and Lord, your word, we are to treasure it as we have 
uh, have, as we've discovered today. We are to cry out for it. We are to tune into it. We are to concentrate on it. We are to ask it. We are to, to ask questions of it, God. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we all dig into your word this week, Lord, that we would ask the question. We would ask these questions and we would truly observe, what does it mean? What do I see? And as we see next week, what do I need to do based upon what I've seen? God, let us be not just hearers of the word, but doers of your word, and let us dig in deep into the details. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Hey guys, we're so glad that you connected with us again today. I hope that message challenged you to go out and be the church, to live out all the great things that God wants for us and wants for this world. Hey parents, again, we haven't forgotten about you. Make sure you go to onechurch.tv slash kids. Let your children experience the awesome stuff we have from over there. And stay connected. If you have a student, middle school through high school, stay connected with onechurch.tv slash students. That'll let you know what's going on in the life of Inside Out. Hang tight for the five after immediately following this service. We're so glad that you connected with us. Go be the church.